So welcome to Cultural Site Stewardship. I'm Elizabeth Hora, public archeologist at the Utah State Historic Preservation Office. And I am one of several archeologists here at the SHPO who are building our new Cultural Site Stewardship Program. And I am so excited to see all of you this morning. Um, a lot of faces that I know, a lot of names that I recognize. So welcome everybody. I'm so glad you're here. Let's get started. So. We've got two and a half hours today and we do have a pretty packed program and it's ultimately going to leave you with a clear understanding of the site stewardship program, what stewards do and our timeline for getting out into the field and getting to work. So we'll begin by describing what stewardship is in that what is site stewardship portion. And I know it's kind of review for a lot of you, but since our program might be a little bit different, um, you might be able to, to pick up a couple of things that maybe you didn't know. Um, we'll talk about also what are the duties of a steward and what benefits stewards enjoy. After a short break, we'll talk about Utah archaeology with a focus on the kinds of sites that stewards can work on. We have over 12,000 years of human history here in Utah, and that's represented through over 100,000 archeological sites. So I'm pretty confident that we'll be able to find a site that you are excited to work on. And the very last section I have planned for today is an open discussion with all of you about what you would like to see in this program. We're designing the program from right now. So now is a great time to build it around your wants and your needs, um, what you would like to get out of the site stewardship program. And you know, there really is no stewardship without you guys. So we want to be responsive to your needs right out of the gate. All that, um, let's introduce ourselves and I'll start. So I'm Elizabeth and some of you probably already know me through my work as public archeologist and my former work as compliance archeologist at the Utah State Historic Preservation Office. Um, I shorthand that as SHPO. So if you hear me say SHPO, Utah State Historic Preservation Office, it's just the place where I work. Um, I hold a master's degree in archeology span and specifically I know about Fremont archeology span and what we archeologists call archeometric dating, which honestly just means counting stuff in archeology span talk. So I know a lot about radiocarbon dating and tree ring research. I've been here at the SHPO for about four and a half years, and I live in the Wasatch Back. Uh, please feel free to get a hold of me anytime using this email and phone number. And as an added COVID bonus, that phone number links straight to my personal cell phone. So please, if it's after hours, be cool. <laughs> um, but I will always try to get back to you um, quickly. Uh, it's easiest to contact me via email. Um, and if I can't get you an answer right away, I will try to connect you with someone who can. Um, and if, for those of you who maybe don't know me, in this picture here, uh, I'm the one in the blue and I'm showing you what the underside of my nose looks like, which is kind of my famous pose. Um, and I'm talking to people about fossils, which I know nothing about. So that's the most professional picture I could find. Uh, that says something about me, I'm sure. <laughs> So I actually, <laughs> that's me, <laughs> and I want to hear about all of you guys. Um, so, you know, what is it that brings you here today? And like I said, I do want to preserve people's anonymity, um, and I don't want anyone to feel put on the spot. You certainly don't have to jump in, but if you'd like to introduce yourself, here's how this will work. On Zoom, you should be able to find a raise hand button. Click that, and it'll let me know that you want to say hi. Um, you know, in the, in the meantime, let me see. In the meantime, I know that we've got a couple of people from our office on, and I will put them on the spot just to kick it off. So uh, Savannah, hi. Hi, Elizabeth, thanks for the introduction. Hi everybody, I am Savannah Agardi. I'm the compliance archeologist, so I am what Elizabeth used to be. Um, just a little bit about me. I've been at SHPO since January, so I'm still a little new, but I'm loving it and getting the hang of everything. Um, I'm helping run the site stewardship program, mostly um, coordinating our relationships with the federal and state agencies that may be participating in the program. Um, 
I hold a BS from uh, in archaeology and anthropology uh, from the University of Utah, and I'm currently doing my master's degree at Johns Hopkins University in cultural heritage management. Um, I specialize in archaeology in Great Basin and Southwest archaeology, as well as lithics, or otherwise known as stone tools, and zooarchaeology too, which is the study of human and animal relationships in prehistory. So that's just a little bit about me. Um, you can find my contact information on the Utah Division of State History's website if you ever like to contact me. Um, yeah. Awesome. Thank you, Savannah. Uh, Rachel Smith. Hi. Are you there? I saw that you raised your hand. Okay, well, we will get back to I got you. Hey, there, there you, you are. are. Hi. Hi, sorry. I was just trying to find my unmute button. I understand. Yeah, yeah, we can all hear you. Do you want to uh, introduce yourself with your name and a little bit about yourself? What brings you here today? Sure. My name's Rachel Smith. I'm coming to you from snowy Uray, Colorado, though I live in Grand Junction. Um, I'm a, uh, I'm very, feel very fortunate to be a project archaeology uh, master teacher. So it's been a little challenging with the COVID to do a great deal of um, teacher training right now. But um, I spent a lot of time in southeastern Utah, uh, Cedar Mesa area, and um, concerned about developments there. Certainly want to help um, uh, keep an eye on sites, uh, talk to the public about sites, um, and uh, let, know, let people know about our wonderful resources here in uh, southeastern Utah and uh, southwestern Colorado. Awesome. Thank you so much. We're really glad you're here. And Stacy, I see your hand is up. Hi. Hi, I'm Stacy. I don't have any degrees or anything like that. I am just a member of the public, very interested in archaeology. Um, in fact, I'm in Eagle Mountain. They had a really small dig out here yesterday, but they had too many volunteers already. So I didn't get to do that, but it's always been my dream to know more about archaeology. We've got a little bit of petroglyphs out here that I kind of visit quite often and take pictures at different times of the day. You can see different things and you know so I'm just here to learn and see what I can do. That's so cool. Yeah and um, I mean I'm sure you've got as much maybe more hours in the field as any other professional archaeologist so please don't feel like you need you know some sort of letters after your name. You absolutely don't to be a good archaeologist. And Eagle Mountain is very cool. There's some great rock imagery out there. Um, Tony, hi. Love it if you could introduce yourself. Absolutely, Tony Timmons. I'm from Henderson, Nevada. Uh, I'm on the State Board of Museums and History in the state of Nevada, appointed by the governor. And we oversee SHPO here in the state of Nevada. And uh, I am also a Nevada site steward. Oh, that's so cool. How do you like being a Nevada site steward? I love it. Of course, I can't tell you where my sites are, right? Because we're not allowed to mention that, but, but I really enjoy it. I, I think it's great to get out and do some hiking. And it, it was fun to introduce my son to the whole idea of archaeology. And okay, I'm an Indiana Jones fan. Even though there's no fortune and glory, there's a lot of fun. And I love doing it. <laughs> that's really well put. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Rosetta Walker. Hi. Good morning. I'm Rosetta Walker, a member of the Rosebud Sioux Tribe living in Tempe, Arizona, the occupied lands from the Akamil Aatam and Peeposh peoples in Phoenix, Arizona. And I'm a member of the Pueblo Grande Museum. I'm the community liaison, a volunteer position. And I've just always been interested in archaeology and have been a member of the museum for at least 10 or 12 years. Um, our site is uh, we just celebrated our 90th anniversary of the city of Phoenix actually having the museum on its grounds. And of course, I'm sure you're quite familiar with Pueblo Grande Museum that expands the uh, Valley of the Sun here in Phoenix with uh, hundreds of miles of hand dug canals that provided water to the peoples that inhabited this land thousands of years ago. So I'm very grateful and thankful for tuning in today and thank you. 
Yeah, so glad to have you all the way from Tempe. I actually used to live in Tucson myself. Um, beautiful country out there and wonderful people. Um, so we're so glad that you're here. Is there anyone else who wants to say hi? Uh, sure. Elizabeth, I'll hop in real quick. Yeah, hey Tim. Hi, nice to see you. I gotta leave for another meeting at 10 to 10.30, but I'll be back after that. My name's Tim Riley. I'm the curator of archeology span at the Prehistoric Museum, uh, part of Utah State University, Eastern down in Price, and happy to see such a robust group of people on the call. Yeah, thanks Tim, really glad you're here. And Joel, uh, Joel Boomgarden, hey Joel. Hi guys, my name's Joel Boomgard. I'm the lead staff archeologist for uh, CITLA, Trust Lands Administration. Um, I've been with the agency for 19 years now, um, and I'm just here because I expect I'll be working with some of you as we are one of the kind of larger landowners in the state. Um, so I, I'm just kind of here to check it out and get involved as best I can with you guys. And uh, yeah, I look forward to working with some of you. Thank you, Joel. We're so glad you're here. It's so important that you know, we have some folks from agencies and I see a couple of other people from agencies too. I don't want to put them on the spot though. Um, anyone else want to say hi? Okay, and that is totally good. I mean, at any point too, if you want to jump in, um, you know, jump in with comments, you can also introduce yourself at that point as well. Let me get my screen sharing back up here. Oops. And yeah, we can keep rolling on. Talk about what is site stewardship? Pardon. All right, so what is site stewardship and how can we do it? So. We have a few slides coming up that will give you a good understanding of site stewardship. So you guys can just feel to kick back, relax, and learn for a few minutes here. Archaeological sites face threats every day, and site stewards are our first line of defense against these threats. So in this image, you can see a prehistoric ochre painting um, of you know, maybe a deer, maybe an elk. It's been shot. Um, there's some pretty good bullet holes in its stomach there. People have scratched their own names above it. Looks like something Sean. Um, and there's a, a little bit of spray paint on it too. So archaeological sites face threats like these human caused threats and they also face threats from the natural world too. As a normal course of things, there's rock spall, flooding, erosion, um, these are all natural processes that can all harm archaeological sites. And while it's probably true that not everything needs to be fought tooth and nail to prevent, you know, rock walls fall to the ground. That's their nature. Um, it's good for us and it's good for land managers to know when that happens. Um, you know, we might not react to every threat, um, but it's, it's good to monitor that and maintain it. Um, and also, we definitely want people ask to tr ask people to trespass on private property, like it is you know in this photo. Um, but we will have stewards on uh, public land to uh, monitor for damage. And so, as a site steward, you'll probably be the first to observe changes in your site. And when you report those changes, you know we we might be able to take some sort of an action to uh, to remedy it. Archaeological site stewards are citizen scientists. So the people in this photo are helping identify artifacts on a site. You can see some pin flags out there uh, where we're actually starting to map a site. So we're putting pin flags down to see where artifacts are, and then we will map where concentrations are as well. Um, so, um, as a site steward, you'll be able to be collecting data um, that helps us understand patterns of damage to archaeological sites. 
So that's a really critical piece of information that we don't always have. Um, we, we don't tend to collect data on damage to archeological sites right now. And so this program, I really expected in the first few years, we're going to get some really great data and some really fantastic scholarship out of it, fueled by the data that our citizen scientists collect. It's going to really help advance our understanding of how and why archeological sites become damaged and how we can prevent unnecessary loss to our history. Um, and I see that there is some chatter on the chat. Um, it turns out that the raise hand thing is not showing up on people's screen. So R. Matthews, do you wanna take yourself off mute and say hi? I'm so sorry we, so sorry it was having trouble earlier. We have R. Matthews and Karen Edwards who were having, they could like the raise hand option just isn't showing up for them. Sorry, uh, my name's Rick Matthews. I'm just a, like I said, I'm an average person. Uh, I don't have a degree in uh, uh, archaeology or history. My The letters behind my name are CPA, so <laughs> I can do that. But uh, I'm a member of URARA. Um, that's how I heard about this, and I'm excited to learn what I can do better. So thank you for doing this. Hey, so glad you're here. I think you guys probably know uh, my fondness for URARA. You guys are wonderful. And um, Karen Edwards, do you want to say hi? Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Great. This is Karen Edwards, and I am also a member of URARA. I do a lot of botany work, and during my work, sometimes I see archaeological um, lithics and other sites, and I've always been interested in archaeology. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. And just so you guys know, we're saying the word URARA. Um, it's an acronym for Utah Rock Art Research Association. So if you're not familiar, um, it's people who love rock imagery and do a fantastic job really on their own of, of checking it out. Um, Hey, Marty, it looks like maybe you want to say. Oh, you found me. Yeah. Yes, I just wanted to enter my, introduce myself. I'm Marty Thomas. I'm from Moab, Utah, and I've been a site steward for the state of Utah, the BLM, and the National Park Service for 20 years. Not all of, not all of them for 20 years, but we've been doing it for 20 years. Thanks, Marty. Yeah, if you guys haven't met Marty before, she's one of the very active people here in Utah. Uh, an interview with, I'm pretty sure Marty and her husband, Daryl, is part of what is um, guiding the philosophy for the development of this program. So <laughs> we're really happy you're here. Thank you. Hey, thank you. Oh, and I also have to say that I have another meeting at 1015, so I'll be leaving you for a little bit, but back again. Yep, such is the nature of these things. So feel free to hop in and out. Okay, great. Um, hey, Wanda, uh, Wanda Rashkow from Friends of Cedar Mesa. Do you wanna say hi? All right, you froze there for a minute, Elizabeth. So <laughs> it's probably my internet. Hi everybody, I'm Wanda Rashkow. I work for Friends of Cedar Mesa. I'm an archaeologist with a checkered past of working for the Forest Service, the BLM, the Park Service. And as of the past three years, I've been working to develop a site stewardship program for the Bureau of Land Management in Utah. And we will, Friends of Cedar Mesa and myself, be working with Elizabeth and the new program to transition. So all of you who are working with the BLM program now, don't worry, you are not being abandoned. We will transition you guys into the new program over the next few months. Thanks, Elizabeth. Thank you, Wanda. Um, Wanda's been so fantastic. And like she said, no one's, no one's being abandoned and no one's being left behind. Does anyone else want to say hi?
Okie doke. Cool. Well, I will try to keep an eye on the chat. Um, like I said, it's not always easy for me. So please hop in if I'm ignoring people on the chat um, and just holler at me and, and let me know to pause. So I'm going to start my screen share once again. You know, perhaps. <laughs> okay, great. Okay. So site stewards are citizen scientists. And another fun fact about site stewardship, um, archeological stewards are active in most Western states and Utah included, we're kind of highlighted in here because we're gonna be a special case like we talked about. Um, so stewards and their work is so important that a lot of states use stewards to try to help maintain up-to-date and accurate site records, monitor threatened sites, and sometimes even take part in site stabilization. So, you know, Utah has a program, um, and as you can see, basically all of our neighbors have site stewardship programs as well. Um, some of them are, um, most of them are statewide, and you do see that, you know, like Oregon and Tennessee have programs for site stewardship. They're not necessarily statewide. So as you head east, where there is less and less federally and state owned land, you really see a drop off in the statewide site stewardship programs. Um, in the West, because we have so much public land, it's really up to us, the public, to take care of it. Site stewards also become part of a community of people who not only love to learn about archeology, span they're active and they take part in stewardship events. We know that you are all very busy <laughs> and perhaps no, perhaps COVID is making you even more busy as you try to juggle your job and now teaching your kids at home. <laughs> so we really appreciate that you're taking the time to help us protect the past. I really do genuinely appreciate that. Thank you. And to show it, the Utah Cultural Site Stewardship Program wants to give back to stewards, whether that be special presentations on topics that you guys are interested in, camping weekends that we all take together, or making trainings more fun by doing them outside, and of course, bringing snacks. The Site Stewardship Program that's currently active in Utah does all of these things on a regional level. And the Utah Cultural Site Stewardship Program aims to have both regional and statewide gatherings. So whether you wanna take trips to visit archeological sites that are in your own neck of the woods, or whether you'd like to take a weekend trip to see something new somewhere, um, the Site Stewardship Program should have you covered. And of course, there's no pressure if you don't wanna hang out with people. <laughs> this is not required. This is just, if you wanna do it, it's super fun. Okay, so how are we gonna do all this? Um, and, you know, most importantly, who's bringing the snacks to the training? <laughs> so it's the Utah SHPO. The Utah SHPO has been tasked with creating this program by the state of Utah. In the 2020 regular legislative session, um, a bill created this program and it actually passed unanimously. Um, and then in our most recent special session, we've been given the green light to hire a full-time statewide site stewardship coordinator. So we, we take all of this support from elected officials really seriously. Um, you know, you guys elected those folks. It's presumably the will of the people to have a site stewardship program. So we, it's up to us to make sure that it's the very best site stewardship program. Um, we will be hiring a full-time coordinator we expect before 2021. And like Savannah mentioned, you know, Savannah, myself, Chris Merritt, a few of us are pulling double duty as part-time stewardship coordinators. So we're really excited to have that full-time hire come on. So we've talked a little bit about the site stewardship coordinator. I wanna give you guys a little bit of information on what the coordinator does. And then what do stewards do? The coordinator will work with stewards. <laughs> that was a fun noise. The coordinator will work with stewards and agency officials who manage public lands. 
the, they will also take care of the normal operation of the program. As a steward, you'll interact with the site stewardship coordinator a lot. They'll likely be the first person that you meet when you sign up to become a site steward, and they will be the person who works with you to identify the archaeological sites that you want to monitor. They will organize and probably even conduct your training, and they'll also be the person that you can call with any questions or concerns that you have. And when you are a steward and you turn in your site stewardship monitoring reports, it's going to be that site stewardship coordinator who will look over the data and pass it along to the archaeological records department. From archaeological records here at the SHPO, it then gets dispersed out to every and all state agencies and professional archaeologists. The site stewardship coordinator will also work with federal and state land management agencies to identify sites that are good candidates for the program. So these agency officials also will have certain reporting requirements and some other bureaucratic level stuff that they need to perform. And so the site stewardship coordinator can relieve some of that pressure for them. The coordinator can do some of that work as part of the normal operation of the program. And our goal with that is to return some of the agency's archaeologists time back to them so they can go do the fun stuff like visit sites with you guys and show you how archaeologists investigate sp certain specific archaeological sites. And the last major component um, that this coordinator is going to have to do is just run the program, you know, make sure that all the stewards are happy and loving their sites um, and organize cool events and programs. Um, so, you know, this is a lot. <laughs> this is a lot for one person to do. But um, it is a full-time job, and we expect a lot out of our, our site stewardship coordinator. We have not um, flown the position yet, so if you know of anyone, maybe have them contact me, and I'll be sure to send them the uh, job application when that does come online, hopefully in the next couple of weeks. Okay, so that's what the site stewardship coordinator does. What do stewards do? what would you guys do? Um, so maybe feels like I've been selling you pretty hard on all the reasons why you should become a steward, like talking about fun stuff like camping. Um, but site stewardship actually, you know, it is, it is a volunteer job that we take very seriously. And there are duties. So once you've signed on to become a site steward, the first order of business is we'll get you into a training that will have a classroom component and an in the field component. These training sessions we're thinking will start in the late winter or early spring, and we'll know a little bit later um, whether we get to do those in person, right? It's just the nature of our 2020 apocalypse times that uh, it's very hard to plan for the future, but we're very hopeful that we'll get to do that in person. I'm actually pretty optimistic that we'll have a safe and effective vaccine um, and I assume that you guys are all like me and you're just dying to do an in-person training. So the classroom portion will take a few hours, um, and that's really just to make sure that you're comfortable with the rules and procedures, and then we'll get outside. So the field portion will help you become comfortable with the monitoring app and what the specific monitoring procedures are for each site. Um, the the, so we are developing an app. I've, I've mentioned that app a few times. Um, and it's going to be an app that you can use on your phone or your tablet to make monitoring easy. You will not need um, self-service. I know that there are a lot of places in Utah, particularly places that are remote or at the very bottoms of canyons where you just don't have cell signal. Um, usually your GPS is working. So we'll, we'll cross that bridge when we get there, but just it's going to be just fine. You'll be able to record things on your phone and then it'll upload it once you get back into cell range. Um, so you will pick at least one site to monitor. And I don't necessarily know that we'll have a cap on the number of sites that you can monitor, but I'm going to recommend you take it slow at first, especially if you're a new steward. Um, we want to spend a lot of time with you on that first trip out showing you your specific site or two sites as the case may be um, and getting you up to speed on the particular history of that site 
and what has already been recorded for it. You know, we've probably already got forms on the site. And so we want to make sure that you're really comfortable with all of that information. And so we'll talk a little later about the types of sites, but every site is unique and has its own story and its own challenges. Um, we'll have a professional archaeologist accompany you on that first trip so that you can make sure that you understand the site inside and out. And you'll always have the site stewardship coordinator that you can call with any questions in the future. And in the chat, I see Tony Timmons has asked about ARPA training. Yes, so for those of you uh, who are maybe new to the world of all of these silly acronyms, ARPA is um, the Archaeological Resources Protection Act, and that is the federal law that we can use to prosecute criminals who have damaged or stolen artifacts or other things from an archaeological site. Um, yeah, there will be a little bit of ARPA training in there. Um, when you walk onto your site, you've got to be prepared to expect a crime scene, essentially. Um, if there has been damage or looting to that site, you may be asked to, um, to, to fill, not fill out an ARPA report, that's going to be a, a federal agency official, but give us some information um, so that that report can get started so that law enforcement can be activated. So that's a great question, Tony. And the short answer is, yeah, ARPA training. <laughs> um, so, you know, alert authorities to significant damage or changes. That's, that's sort of part of that ARPA training on there. Um, you will be asked to visit your site about four times a year. Uh, once per season would be great. And you know, if there's bad weather or if you're feeling sick for a little while, it's not a big deal. You can just sit out that trip. Um, and then, you know, once you're at the site, you'll record your information. It'll be a simple app that leads you through the steps to investigate your site. It will have prompts that ask you to look for certain kinds of damage and it will help you photograph that damage and automatically flag our office if you find that your site is severely damaged. And once it flags our office, it's then our duty to contact that uh, land managing official. So the very last thing on here, uh, when you're out at your site, you may come across other visitors. Friends of Cedar Mesa has a Visit with Respect Ambassador program that's really, really fantastic. And we encourage you to take it if you want to chat with other site visitors in a way that is respectful and informative. And we can give you some more information and links to that later on. All right, and one last point um, <laughs> before we take some questions and maybe head into a break, perhaps a little early. A lot of people have asked how the Utah Cultural Site Stewardship Program is working with the Utah Heritage Stewardship Program run by Friends of Cedar Mesa. And you heard from Wanda earlier, she is really the, the person behind that Utah Heritage Stewardship Program. So they're almost the same program. Um, what we're doing is inheriting a lot of the successes of the Friends of Cedar Mesa program. And we're adding on to that the connections that we've made through you know, working at the Utah SHPO, the Utah State Historic Preservation Office, to expand the reach of the program. So our office works every day with lots of agencies, BLM included, which is sort of that Cedar Mesa program works with the BLM. Um, and we also work with, you know, the state park system, the Forest Service, the National Park Service, Joel Boomgarden is on from SITLA, State Institutional Trust Lands Administration. So we're meeting with these sites um, starting actually, I think next week to talk about what they need out of stewardship programs and to help us identify sites on their lands that would be good candidates for site stewardship. Using this program, we envision that stewards will be able to work on a wider range of sites than would otherwise be possible. And we also anticipate that you guys as stewards will be able to sites, find sites that are kind of close to you that you're interested in stewarding. Um, and like I've said, Friends of Cedar Mesa and Wanda in particular, they've done a really fantastic job developing their program. And we're really lucky to have such awesome and supportive partners in them. And so for those of you who are stewards right now, um, let us know. You, you've already gone through what's going to be basically the same training. 
And so we want to make sure that you get credit for that work. You can always take a second training if you want to, but <laughs> you're probably, if you're, if you, if you feel confident, you're probably ready to go. And we won't reassign your site or anything either. We'll make sure that if you love the sites you're working on, that you get to keep those. Um, if you want a different site though, we'll always find you something else. So I think that's probably a lot of information. Um, and I'll, I'll leave it there for a little bit on the site stewardship program. Now is a really fantastic time to ask questions if you have any. So I'll take that off. Um, and again, you know, if you can find the, the raise hand button, please feel free to use that. If not, you can just take yourself off mute and we'd love to hear from you. No questions. Oh, Tony. Um, will other states training work? That's a great question, Tony. I don't know enough about other states training. So I think we'd have to take a look at it. I mean, certainly you'll probably want help with the app because the odds of our apps being very similar are pretty low. Um, had it with Samantha in Nevada. Yeah, I'll check with Samantha and see what their program entails. Um, we might be able to maybe give you like an abbreviated training because I'm sure the basics are the same, right? I mean, you already know what ARPA is. So you've already got a pretty good handle on this. Um, so maybe it's the kind of thing that um, just showing up to the in-field training would be adequate for you. That would probably get you up to speed. Um, Steve and Diana Acerson, did you guys want to say something? Yeah, I just had a question since we're already stewards uh, uh, with Wanda on the other program. So this will take that over pretty much. I just wanted to be clear. Yes, that's exactly right. Um, our program is going to start spinning up in the late winter, early spring, and their program will wind down. I think uh, we had talked about Friends of Cedar Mesa will conduct trainings through, I want to say February. And then in February, we'll start doing those training, which is why we want to say that, you know, your training will count because it's not fair if you took a training in January and then in February we say, do it again. Like it's, it's going to be essentially the same training. Um, and so, yeah, if you are already a steward, you're, you're ready to go. It's the same program. We'll transition you over. Okay. Thanks, hon. Yeah. Thanks. Elizabeth, this is Shirley, uh, Shirley Lane from the Monticello Field Office. I have a question. Um, are stewards trained in fixing the, um, uh, like the bullet holes and stuff like that? Or if not, uh, do you contact tribes to help with uh, working and to fixing things? How, how does that work? Oh man, that is such a great question. Um, so the really short answer is no. So site stewards, if they find that damage, they'll, you know, do a full forensic workup, basically. They'll photograph it, they'll tell us about it, they'll describe it to the best of their ability. And then we pass on that information to you guys at the, at the BLM. Um, and it's up to the BLM to make that decision. Um, usually with tribes about how and whether um, some sort of, you know, repair work should occur. There are some tribes who claim ancestry to these, who I should say are linked ancestrally to these sites. Um, and it's their preference that we not touch it anymore. Um, even if it's been damaged, you know, the philosophy there is, more tinkering with it isn't going to return it to how it was. More tinkering with it is going to expand. And so it's really up to the BLM through their tribal consultation and their consultation with other interested stakeholders um, to find some sort of a solution to that. Um, in some cases, it's decided that we will do some sort of damage remediation to those um, to those rock imagery panels. And in that case, we usually will call in an expert. Um, we'll usually call in a conservator, someone who has a background in the physical and chemical 
properties of these items um, so that we can make sure that anything we do is not harmful um, because you know that's that's ultimately <laughs> the goal right um, and so at that point the BLM may choose to involve volunteers that's kind of a, a case-by-case basis but as site stewards if you know that this damage has occurred you can report it to the BLM and say hey if and when this will be um, repaired can you contact me I'd, I'd like to be there for it I'd like to help out um, so does that kind of answer your question Shirley did I it does um, I have another question um, if the damage is really extensive do you close a site that's another great question. Um, so sometimes when damage is really extensive, the land managing agency will decide to close a site, whether that is um, uh, piling up brush or rocks at the trailhead, installing signage, patrolling it more frequently. We here at the Utah Cultural Site Stewardship Program, um, that's not something that we can do. We do not manage this land on behalf of a federal land managing agency. We just provide um, stewards for that land managing agency. So we're just providing information. We're not able to take action. So, um, you know, that's, that's really going to be up to, you know, in your case, the BLM, the archeologists, the planners, the, um, the office managers up there to make that decision on a case by case basis. Oh, okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you. And we have a question in the chat um, from Rick Matthews. Can stewards share a site? Absolutely. It's probably preferable if you're able to go out there with a partner, with a buddy. Um, and part of that is for reasons of safety, but part of that is I find that when I discuss a site with my colleagues, we're both keying into things that we wouldn't have otherwise seen. Sometimes if I go out to do an archeological survey on my own, I might miss something on a site because, you know, I'm, I'm counting lithics, I'm counting ceramics, I'm doing this, I'm doing that. And maybe I just haven't spent the time noodling around to find this little fire affected rock concentration that could be the remains of an ancient hearth. So it's great to have a buddy. Um, we, we prefer the buddy program. Um, so site stewards absolutely can share a site and it's not like <laughs> you'll be able to sort of find a friend, right? Um, we're not going to assign you to a site with someone that you absolutely can't work with. We'll make sure that everyone is a happy, friendly unit when they go out. Um, so Rick, I hope that answered your question and I, I kind of hope that's the answer that you wanted to. Are there any other questions? Elizabeth, this is Troy. Just an, an extension on that question. So uh, sometimes with ARPA, <clears throat> there's non-disclosure that's required once, you know, we're informed of a site location. And, and so we get into some weird issues where sometimes, you know, I'm a rock art guy and I may already know about the site and then I agree to be a site steward, and then I'm told that I actually can't disclose the site location anymore, even though I already knew about it. So for example, you know, I'm happy take, to take a buddy there, but I may not be able to lead a Urara field trip there. How does, how does that work? That's a really interesting question. So let me make sure I understand it. So this is a site that presumably doesn't like, I'm just going to make a hypothetical site. This hypothetical site presumably doesn't have a trail to it, is not on maps, and is not otherwise a site that's known in the public. But you know about it. And you knew about it as a member of the public before you even started monitoring it. And so now there's sort of a regulation on you that wasn't there before. Is that what I understand? Absolutely correct, yep. Interesting. And I think that might be on an agency by agency basis. I understand the philosophy grounding that, that you know, once you become a site steward, at least through our, at least through our program, 
you sign a contract um, to abide basically as a state employee would, right? Um, and so when you're working with the BLM, you're essentially functioning as a BLM employee would. And a BLM employee is bound by certain rules and regulations to not disclose site locations. Um, so I think that might change based on your land management, you know, jurisdiction. But, you know, ultimately, I, I think as even though it sounds very silly and in practice, it doesn't maybe make a lot of sense. I think that for legal reasons, I kind of think that's how it's got to be. Well, generally speaking, you know, if Urara is doing our job right on field trips, we're getting clearance from the land management agency before we go there anyway. So, you know, I think that's okay. But, it, you know, it's just an interesting issue. You know, I've, when I've been involved in programs before, I've actually declined sites because I've said, you know, that's a site and I'd like to be able to take people there that I know. And so I'd rather do something else, do another site. That's, yeah, so that's interesting. We are starting our, <laughs> we're starting our meetings with agency officials in, I, like I said, I think it's next week. So we'll bring that up um, because we want to make sure that we're clear on that when we tell people how they can interact with the site in their day-to-day -day lives. I mean, obviously posting site locations on the web is, is a definite no-go. Um, and if you wanted to bring a group of, you know, more than a few people out to a site, there's usually some sort of special use permit that's required. So, yeah, that's interesting. I will ask about it and we will get back to you on that question. But, you know, prepare yourself for the answer to be, we, we do need to keep a lock on where these sites are, especially if they're under threat, especially if it's a site that has been looted in the past, could be looted in the future, something like that. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. These are really fantastic questions. Um, <laughs> I don't know if you could tell, but I'm like, oh, wow. These are things that I need to really keep on my radar. So um, thank you guys for them. Um, yeah, Tony says that in Nevada, you can't disclose. That, that does make sense. It feels strange in practice, but it makes sense from a legal point of view. Are there any other questions? Okay, well, we're a little early for break, but I think that's actually gonna serve us really well because um, yeah, in Nevada, you can't even mention or discuss your site. That is a lot. Um, but I understand where that's coming from. Um, so for our presentation today, we're going to take a 15 minute break. So it is 1024. We'll try to get back here at 1040. And after that, oh, sorry, Karen, <laughs> before... <laughs> Pulled the trigger too early. Um, we do have another question. Why is the program shifting from the BLM to the state? Such a good question. So it's not exactly shifting from the BLM to the state. So the program that we're running will include the BLM and it will also include other land management agencies. Right now, the program that the BLM uses has been developed and run by Friends of Cedar Mesa. And so that's that one-to-one -one Friends of Cedar Mesa to BLM relationship. And so now we're coming along and we're doing a one-to-many relationship where we at the SHPO are going to have a program that the BLM also participates in along with you know, Forest Service, SITLA, State Parks, um, whoever else wants to join. And so that provides benefits to the stewards and to the land managing agencies. To the stewards, it means that you will take one training that will be good on BLM land, forest service land, you name it. You don't have to sign different agreements with different agencies. You don't have to take different trainings. You don't have to learn different recording procedures. 
it's all going to be uniform across the state for you guys. And for the agencies, it helps them out because we will have, um, we already serve data to these entities. Um, anyone with an archaeological permit is eligible to sign up to our database that has all of the sites statewide. And we do that, you know, for regular business reasons. Um, archaeologists every day are hired to go look for sites and it helps to know if someone's already been in that area and has already looked and what that site is. So an archaeologist can download that information from our system, um, including agency archaeologists. So we are, we call ourselves the data stewards for the state. Um, we hold all of that data. So now when we get site stewardship information, that data will be disseminated statewide through that database. Currently, that information resides in each particular agency unit and cannot be used for, say, consultation for when there's a project going on. So we've had, we've had issues where site stewards will say, well, I've gone to that site a hundred times and, and the agency officials will say, we don't need to send a, a professional archaeologist out to this site. Every six months, we've had someone go visit it. But it doesn't fulfill our legal requirements because we at the SHPO didn't know that that was happening. So this will help out agencies. It should, you know, relieve some of their uh, reporting requirements burdens in that way. Um, so in that sense, the program is a, a real help to these agencies. Um, so that's kind of why the program is shifting from the BLM to the state. It makes a lot of sense for it to live at the state since it's statewide and it gives a lot of benefits uh, to both the, the stewards and to the agencies. And so thank you for that. Um, Rick Matthews also asks, can we get the site steward training before we have a site? Absolutely. Um, there will be site stewardship trainings that will be publicly available. We will advertise them widely in different regions throughout the state. Um, and we'll get those started probably in February, March at the very latest. You can attend one or more of those at any time. And you don't have to already have a site in order to do it. Um, you, will, you, you will be able to be assigned a site, of course, but if you just wanna take the training, see what it's all about and not commit to a site, it's totally great. And we have one more question on the chat from Tony. Um, and he asks if it's based on trinomials. Um, yes, we do use Smithsonian trinomials in this state. So our prefixes are 42, that's our state number, and then two letters based on our county. Uh, we have, what, 29 counties, 30 something counties here in Utah, I forget. Um, so we have, have a unique trinomial for every site in the state. Does that answer your question, Tony? I hope it does. Absolutely. Okay, great. Thanks. And Karen Edwards asks, will the site stewardship coordinator have an archaeology degree? It's a really fantastic question. Um, the short answer is yes. So we just finished the other day writing up the job description and the nature of the job will require whoever is the site stewardship coordinator to be able to get what we call a PLPCO permit. That's the Public Lands Policy Coordinating Office. And they hold all of the permitting um, you know, stuff for professional archeologists. For example, I have a PLPCO permit. And you need to have that in order to access our database because site data is protected by federal and state laws. It's held pretty close. We need someone to be able to legally access that information. So um, generally a site stewardship or uh, generally to get a PLPCO permit, you have a master's degree. There are exceptions made for some people who have bachelor's degrees in archeology span who can demonstrate a particular depth of experience in archaeology. So the site stewardship coordinator will be some kind of expert in archaeology. And 
Tim Timmons asks, will we need GPS devices? If you have a smartphone, the answer is probably not. So most smartphones um, have GPS devices in them already that you activate for all kinds of things. And um, that is going to be sufficient since you're not going to be, you know, trying to set up an excavation grid or anything where you're going to need to know exactly where you are down to the centimeter, um, getting a rough estimate of like, ah, I'm within a few meters of this. That's what your phone can do. And that's going to be perfect for our purposes. If you don't have a smartphone, um, then yes, you probably will need a GPS device so that we can send you out there with um, paper forms and a GPS so that you can get the monitoring done. Tim also says, or Tony, sorry, also says, I assume that agencies like the BLM and the National Park Service uh, need to record hours for their volunteer programs. Some people are eligible for like free annual passes and things. And yeah, they do. So when we work with um, agencies, when the site stewardship coordinator is working with agencies to set up the program, we're also asking them what kind of recurring recording requirements they have so that we can collect that data and make that available to them on whatever schedule they need, whether that's monthly or annually. Um, and then they use that information and pass off whatever benefits they have to you guys. So yeah, I mean, like if you get like a, a free America the Beautiful Pass for N number of volunteer hours, you will still be eligible for that. So thank you guys so much for the, the questions in the break. And we are gonna jump in to the second half of our program. Um, and just like the last time, it's gonna be me talking for a little while, so kick back. Um, and if you do have questions, please put them in the chat. Um, I will try to keep monitoring that chat. So let's reorient ourselves. Before the break, we examined what is site stewardship. And we learned that stewards help protect the past by being boots on the ground, monitoring archeological sites. And they flag the attention of archeologists and land managers who can act on any deteriorating or not good situation. We also learned that this program is going to empower stewards to operate across different land jurisdictions and will centralize reporting. So both of these attributes give stewards more power and access to critical resources. For example, you'll have a site stewardship coordinator who will answer the phone, take your call, return your emails. So now let's talk about what kinds of archeological sites need stewarding. And so, as we'll learn, the answer is all kinds, but let's get you up to speed on the archeological vocabulary so that you can define for yourself the kinds of sites that you're interested in. And like I said, a big part of this program is going to be trying to find you a site that you're going to like. So what kinds of sites need stewards? The top row and the bottom row of photographs are kind of two different attributes that sites may have. So the top row is what is the nature, the manifestation of the site. An open site is something that we have a lot of here in Utah. It's not like a rock shelter. Um, it's not something that has architectural components. 99% of our sites are out in sagebrush flats, out in Ponderon Ponderosa pine forests, they are open sites. Um, they may have a subsurface component to them, but they usually don't have anything that's above ground. Um, we have a lot of architectural sites though as well, especially as we um, move into the Fremont and ancestral Puebloan periods and again into the historic period. This photo, I, I really love, I think it's a pretty photo of um, the Salt Air Resort. It's currently managed by Forestry Fire in Salt Lake, and it's out on the south shore of the Great Salt Lake, just outside of Salt Lake City, Utah. You see giant bits of like rebar or something coming out of the ground, and there's also some um, some piles out there as well, some uh, big wood, you know, shafts that are sunk into the ground because this used to be a giant like carnival place, basically. 
And so architectural sites, the architecture need not be fully standing. Sometimes mm -hmm. our rule of thumb is, does it come up to your knee? Then it's architecture. <laughs> um, and so, you know, we've got a ton of architectural sites here in Utah. A lot of people think about Southeast Utah with the really grand um, kivas, granaries, and pueblos. So those are definitely available for stewarding as well. Uh, the last kind that we're gonna really think about here is rock imagery sites. I usually don't say rock art, um, just because I've been told by uh, people who are the descendants of the folks who, who made these images that art can denote you know, a certain kind of thing. So I'm gonna call them rock imagery, just so you know. And under this uh, umbrella, I'm also going to include historic inscriptions as well. We have a lot of nice soft sandstone here and people across the ages have taken advantage of that to leave their mark. And on the bottom row, easy peasy, what kind of sites need stewards? Prehistoric and historic sites. And we'll talk a little bit more about the specific kinds of prehistoric and historic sites. Certain, certain types of sites may appeal to different kinds of people, right? Um, so we've got over 12,000 years of human history and over 100,000 archeological sites. And so this next section is going to introduce you to the kinds of sites that we encounter frequently as archeologists and what special needs those sites may have and what kind of a steward might be a really good fit for that. So start thinking about what are your strengths what would you like to learn more about? And what are the ways that you wanna challenge yourself? And if you don't wanna do that, if you really <laughs> just wanna like, man, I know this era and I love it, that's also great. Uh, but we're gonna give you a little bit of information on different kinds of things, different kinds of challenges that these sites pose. So we're gonna start at the earliest time period, and move on from there. I'm gonna be completely honest, we don't have a ton of sites that are Paleo-Indian or early to middle archaic here in Utah. One of these reasons is that these sites are so old that a lot of their material remnants just didn't last through time. Um, the other reason is that there seems to have been very few people in North America during that stretch of time and so here in Utah, the most that we really find is the occasional spear point from this era, but we usually don't find enough stuff to really constitute an archeological site of its own right. And so that's, you know, the middle and early archaic were really similar to that. There's just not a lot of people around um, from the Pleistocene, that's kind of the Paleo-Indian time, that's the last ice age. And then the archaic is getting into the Holocene, that warming period. Not a lot of people. Um, in fact, throughout the, throughout the early and middle archaic, and especially the middle, Utah got a lot warmer and drier. And so by the middle archaic, it was so warm and dry that we don't see that there's a lot of people living here. And so sometimes we find evidence of early and middle archaic people in the forms of monos and matates, like on that image on the far right. Um, but that's still pretty rare. And so what are the kinds of sites we do find then? Everything from about 2000 BC onward. Uh, that's a lot of late archaic, Fremont and Southstral Puebloan, late prehistoric and historic period sites. So the late archaic, we're placing that as starting around 2000 BC. It varies. Um, that's, a, that's a pretty big thumbnail sketch there that I'm painting, but we'll call it 2000 BC and it ended just after AD 1, you know, it does stretch a few hundred years into the ADs in a lot of areas. But so this is a huge stretch of time when foragers were all over Utah. People traveled up and down the mountains with the changing seasons to get plants for foods and medicines. They hunted animals for food and raw materials. Uh, we see the populations grow and we also see a lot more rock imagery during this time period too. Usually late archaic sites have lots and lots of chipstone tools um, and a particular stylistic tradition that we call the Elko tradition. Sites from this time period tend to be open sites. Uh, there are some that are rock shelters. You might hear them called cave sites as well. Um, but you know, 99% of the time, it's an open site. 
that does not really have architecture. Um, so that would be really great for stewards who are interesting, interested sorry, in hunting technology, um, chipped stone tools, and stratigraphy. Uh, these open sites sometimes have, you know, in a lot of cases, some shallow stratigraphy. Sometimes you can see in like a, Arroyo cuts or something, much deeper stratigraphy. So that would be a really fun challenge for someone who's interested in learning more about stratigraphy. After the late archaic, we see people who we call Fremont and ancestral Puebloan. So archaeologists think that this cultural change came in part due to migration, but, <laughs> but also um, due to uh, the changing climate. Um, sorry, let me start that over. I was reading the chat. Um, so archaeologists uh, think that this cultural change, um, right, came in part due to people moving into the area. But that sort of replacement theory is not really in vogue now. We also think that because the climate was changing, it encouraged the descendants of the people who had always been living there, who had been foragers for thousands of years, it encouraged them to adopt agricultural practices. The Fremont and ancestral Puebloan cultures overlapped each other in time, but not in space. Ancestral Puebloan folks are, were mostly in um, what's now Utah's southern counties, and the Fremont extended north from there through Box Elder and Duchesne counties. We have a lot of Fremont and ancestral Puebloan sites that need stewarding. You can choose from open sites, uh, architectural sites like we talked earlier, and there's also a lot of rock imagery sites that date to this period as well. Most prehistoric sites that have architecture on them come from this era, in fact. Um, so architectural sites are really fun to steward, but also really complex. These sites may have rock imagery on them as well, um, and they also tend to have a wider variety of artifacts than are found on other prehistoric sites. If your stewarding style is to spend a while on a site, take inventory of a huge array of variables, then these sites are gonna be really great for you. Um, also, if you wanted to learn more about people who were transitioning from foraging to farming and back again, or if you'd like to learn more about stratigraphy, consider becoming a steward for these kinds of sites. And I do want to pause just for a moment to answer a question from the chat. Jorge Fulco asks, um, can you address the time requirements? How much is on our own? How much is scheduled ahead with set timelines? Those are really, really great, pres really great questions, rather. Um, I'm going to hold off on the answer until the end of this section, um, but then I will absolutely answer them. I just wanted to let you know, I did see the question, so thank you. Cool, so the, the late prehistoric and ethnohistoric is a time period that we maybe don't think about as much. Um, but there is a really significant period of time after, um, after the Fremont and ancestral Puebloan way of life kind of stopped being used here in Utah. Um, it's not, in some cases, it's that people moved out. Like we, we know famously that in the Four Corners area, people moved further south because that fit with their lifestyle. But it's not as though Utah or even the Four Corners region was abandoned completely. There were people here. And some people moved in to fill the relative void and other people who lived here just decided to go back to that way of life that had been working for thousands of years, that more foraging way of life. Um, so late prehistoric and ethnohistoric sites can be found all across Utah, but it turns out not on my hard drive so I didn't have photographs of actual <laughs> late prehistoric sites. So I'm sorry about that. Um, so the population, just to give you an overview of the time period, the population in Utah declined quite a bit. And so when people had that extra elbow room, they spread out a little, they stopped farming, and they did return to that um, foraging kind of way of life. But now they had a new tool. People adopted bow and arrow technology during the Fremont and ancestral Puebloan period so now these were foragers with upgraded hunting gear. And in this period, people started using horses. Um, and that was one of the single biggest game changers in the history of this continent. 
So there's a lot of really rapid changes that people adapted to that makes the archeological signature really interesting. Um, like one very special day on a site that was actually in Arizona, I found a projectile point, an arrowhead shape for, a, for an arrow, a bow and arrow thing, that had been hammered out of a tin can. So that's a really creative reuse of materials that were starting to become ubiquitous in these people's lives in ways that they'd never been ubiquitous in, honestly, anyone's life. Um, we also, in this time period, uh, even though it's so recent, people lived a little light on the land. You can see that this woman is sitting outside of her wiki up on the photo on the right. And it leaves a very faint archeological trace. So if you're someone that likes to do a little bit of sleuthing, this time period could be really great for you to steward. Um, the archeological signature, you know, for a wiki up like this, I've seen one that I don't think I would have seen on my own. Um, there was another archeologist there leading an excavation and she pointed out an extremely shallow depression. And when she investigated it further, it was a very thin lens of, um, of dust on top of it, and she found a hearth inside. Um, really would have, I don't know that I would have seen it. This was very faint. So if you're someone who has that um, careful attention and that eye to detail, and you want to really challenge yourself on surface manifestations to sites, late prehistoric and ethnohistoric sites would be great. And I also should point out that for all of these sites um, that were um, late prehistoric, ethnohistoric, and, and earlier, you might want to do it if you have a family history. Um, if you are someone of indigenous descent, it might be really cool for you to go to these sites and, you know, learn a little bit about your past. See if there's anything that kind of like rings true or feels right to you today. Because um, I know that We'll switch over to historic sites. I know that for historic sites, there are descendant groups who do like to um, visit these sites. So historic era sites, like I said, are cool for anyone who maybe has a family history or even a more loose um, sort of like ethnic history, um, ethnic connection, or if you like a certain kind of occupation or if you have a family history of a certain occupation. Um, and, you know, I think ultimately for historic sites, people get excited because this seems a little bit more familiar. It gives you a little something that you can latch onto and then use your imagination for how life used to be. Some historic sites, like I said, are inextricably linked to the ethnic communities who made them. Whether it's a Navajo sweat lodge um, in San Juan County or a Japanese camp on the outskirts of a railroad town um, or a mine town that would be home to all manner of immigrants from, um, from Asia and from Europe. Utah Site Stewardship can help you connect to your own personal past. Historic sites, um, like so many of these, can be open sites, architectural sites, or can have historic inscriptions on them. And so, just as a sidebar, oftentimes archaeologists haven't done sufficient research on the people who made historic inscriptions. And this is something that if you have an interest in research, that could be a really fun project for you. I know that I found inscriptions that had been ignored by the archeologists who had originally recorded them. And when I did a little digging, it turned out to be the signature from someone who founded a nearby ghost town, or it was a ghost town today, but it was a small town when he founded it. Um, historic sites are a really good match for someone who wants to do some archeology, span like some actual research archeology. span um, And we can probably get you on the right track to being a real crackerjack archeological researcher if that's where your passion lies. The other thing to know about archeological sites is that they tend to be badly damaged. People will sell bottles, um, glass insulators, and other historic artifacts. And oftentimes mm -hmm. these people are adamant that this should not be an illegal activity. It is illegal though. Um, and so you could see here at, at Terrace, Utah, off of the Transcontinental Railroad grade, people felt like they were being helpful by piling up artifacts that they found by this now shot up um, uh, sign. So two bummers for the price of one. 
And then the photograph on the right is actually from uh, an office associated with a mine outside of Eureka, Utah. And you could see people have spray painted in there. People just used it as a very gross, like, party spot. Um, so, you know, volunteer to monitor a historic site if you are ready and willing to find a potential crime scene. So our training will help you identify the signatures of looting other than like, you know, big hole in the ground. Um, and it'll also give you a step-by-step -step process to follow in order to record evidence and report the theft. So, what kind of sites need stewarding? All of them. And we have a huge variety of sites that need stewarding. And so we're going to try to match people with the sites that they would find interesting, since you'll be returning to those sites again and again. So um, when you sign up to become a site steward, there's a short questionnaire that asks you what kinds of sites you want. And that would be a great place for you to put in, you know, prehistoric, maybe this era. I want an architectural site. I definitely don't want anything with rock imagery because you know, that's emotionally too intense for me, whatever it is, so that we can make sure that we offer you sites that you're going to like. And you don't have to accept a site right away. You can always say like, none of these. I, I've taken a look at, you know, the site records, I've gone out to the site with you, and um, this isn't a site that I'm comfortable with. So, you know, everyone is unique, all the sites are unique. We wanna make sure that we find the site that works best for you. So like I said, you're gonna be seeing it a lot. And so it's not just the sites that are, that have a lot of variables, the stewards themselves have a lot of variables. And we wanna take into consideration a lot of different um, preferences or needs that people have before we offer you a site. Maybe you don't want a site that's too far from home, um, or maybe you're looking for a good excuse to take a weekend trip a few times a year. Um, maybe you're at home on a site that doesn't require long walks over uneven ground. Or maybe your idea of a perfect day stewarding is not seeing another soul. Um, I know I have uh, friends who have children with autism. It would be great for them to not have a site in a noisy, crowded area. So maybe that's a consideration you have as well. You know, we've got so many sites. We're going to find a site that works for you. And if you have other factors that aren't here, other factors that aren't on our um, welcome questionnaire, please feel free to let me know. Um, you can let our site stewardship coordinator know when they're hired, and you can also use the other comment section on our stewardship signup page. All right, <laughs> so that was a long stretch of me talking, and um, I'm going to address Jorge's question first, and then we're gonna turn it over to you guys for the rest of the morning. Um, let me first talk about um, how much time is required, how much is scheduled ahead, things like that. Okay. And if you guys have been stewards too, um, maybe jump in because you probably have more experience than I do. I've actually never been a site steward myself. I started, um, I started in on archaeology when I was, what? 20, 19, and I just never had the opportunity to be a steward. Um, so my understanding is, you know, the training aspect, it's your big upfront time commitment. Um, it's probably going to be about a four hour training and we'll do it some morning. And uh, then the next day that might be a full day out because we'll probably have multiple people come out to the site um, so that we can all learn together how to use that app and how to investigate a site. It's really great to do these things in small groups because I find we get really good questions that way and everyone can learn from each other. After that, um, you're gonna wanna visit your site about four times a year. And the amount of time that you spend on that is highly variable, I'd say. Um, you know, if you're going door to door, like when you leave your house to when you return to your house, that's going to vary based on how far away your site is from your home. And it could also vary, not just based on the complexity of the site, but based on what's happened to the site. If, even if you've got a site that you've been to a hundred times, it's simple, straightforward, you know the things that you look for, the things that you check. If you walk up and find that a flood has, you know, gutted it, it's gonna take you 
a little bit of time to complete that documentation. So, you know, if maybe it only takes you 15 minutes to record your site on a normal day, it, it might take you an hour if, if, you're, if you wanted to do like a really in-depth recording. Um, like I said, that's four times a year. You're always free to monitor your site more often, but we do want to try to get you out there at least once a season. Um, and if you wanted to, uh, you could join us for other kinds of little meetup things like hiking tours, camping. Um, you're always free to, to join another training if you feel like you need to brush up um, or if you had some specific questions that you wanted to ask in person. So there's a lot of flexibility. Um, on the low end, you know, probably a day and a half on the outset and then maybe a, a morning once a season. So I hope that I hope that answers. And then um, Troy says that he wants a site adjacent to a nice restaurant with cool drinks. I think we do have that outside Escalani. Um, so we'll get you a site down there. <laughs> if you're willing to drive for it, I'm sure we can find you a, a site like that or Canab. Canab's a great one. All right, so the, the presentation, I've turned off that share um, and I, do want to hear from you guys about what you want to get out of site stewardship. If you are a current site steward, um, I definitely want to hear from you about what you like about stewarding so that we know what to preserve or what you hate about stewarding so that we know what to change. It's so tough to be the first person to go. I'll be the first person to go. Thanks, Diana. <laughs> <laughs> um, I site steward out at West Mountain, as you know, uh, for Mike Turlip at the BLM Salt Lake Field Office. And he's a very enthusiastic archaeologist, and I, I love that. Um, anyway, um, he actually requested we do it once a month and um, wants a lot of extensive information. So when you have a site like that, um, I, I enjoy doing that. I mean, it's a little harder. There's a little more to it, to it because the sites that I monitor are boulders on the ground and there's about 28 of them in amongst hundreds. And each time we go out, we have to re-identify their locations. So it's a little challenging, but I like that. But, you know, sometimes I feel like you'll get somebody at one of the agencies that does want a little more information than what you're talking about. Uh, is that okay? I mean, can we continue to do that? Oh yeah. I mean, yeah, of course. So the site that Diana's talking about out at West Mountain, um, it is a really active site. It's, um, it's got a lot going on in terms of the people around the site using it for activities that have the potential to cause harm to archaeology. Um, so she's going out there more frequently, I assume, because there's a higher likelihood, a higher frequency of damage being done out there. And Diana has been stewarding for a little while and has been involved in um, archaeology for a little while. So I bet that Mike Turlip recognizes in you as a steward that you can take that extra burden on. Um, so yeah, if, if you guys are going out more frequently or if, you're, if you as a steward feel like a site needs to be monitored more frequently, we'll definitely let you do that. And we'll talk with the agency uh, folks and we'll get all of us in a room together and say like, hey, here's the concern for this site. It needs more frequent monitoring. And we're absolutely happy to um, grab those records, make them available to the BLM and uh, flag them whenever there's a problem. So yeah, very cool. I, I think um, part of my- um, That's a lot, <laughs> good job. <laughs> uh, part of my um, concern too is that on the other end of that spectrum, he's very enthusiastic and wants that. And so people may run, run into that where they have uh, an agency archeologist that wants it's a little more than the average and you know if they were okay with that that should be good to go yeah and you know if someone's not okay with that if someone is like 
once a month is, is too much, we can work to figure out what kind of a schedule might work. Maybe they tag team it with another steward. Um, you know, maybe, maybe I go one month and you go one month. Um, something like that. But yeah, or, you know, maybe it only needs to be every eight weeks instead of every four weeks. Maybe we can live with that. But so we, we can coordinate with the agency what their expectations are then? Mm -hmm. Yep. And so the site stewardship coordinator is there. Um, you can coordinate directly with them and we'll get all three of us together. You can coordinate directly with the agency official. If you feel like that agency official is asking you to do something that um, you were unwilling or unable to do, you can talk to us and we'll uh, work out some sort of dispute resolution. We mostly want everyone to be very happy. Um, and that includes agency officials too, you know, there's, this should be fun. Right. Don't be upset about this. <laughs> so we want to keep Right. I just, I just know they're like within the bill. I am the enthusiasm for rock art specifically is different from field office to field office, depending on who the archeologist is that we're working with on a site. So, you know, I just feel like some people are going to run into those that really don't demand much or, you know, have much enthusiasm for it and others that, really are so it may not be equal throughout our desire to steward in different places uh, well and so we're also hoping that by having the program centralized in the site stewardship coordinator that it's going to even out some of those peaks and valleys of enthusiasm um, especially when you have um, agency personnel who change frequently, um, people who move on, people who have periods of time when they are just really busy doing something else and they, they can't take their nose out of their work for a minute. We'll have that um, site stewardship coordinator there to pick that up and carry it until the agency official is able to devote some time to it again. So hopefully that levels out a little bit of that enthusiasm variance. Um, couple of chat questions. Um, Tony asks, will we need to sign agency agreements as well? Um, that may differ agency by agency. So we'll learn more before uh, the training starts, but we have a site stewardship agreement um, at the state of Utah that you'll sign. And our early talks with the BLM have indicated that the BLM will not need you to sign anything else. That when you, when you sign on board with us, that will be good enough. Um, that could vary for different agencies. So we'll let you know um, when we say, hey, there's a site over here. Are you okay with signing this additional form? And it's usually the same form. Um, will they provide access if there are entry fees or will we have a steward card to cover entry fees? For example, at Zion or Bryce? Another really great question. Um, that's something that we will discuss in our, uh, in our talks with agencies but I honestly can't imagine stewardship shouldn't cost you money. You're doing us a favor. So <laughs> we'll figure something out with that. Um, I'm fairly sure that at state parks, since we're a state agency, we can, we can probably work something out there. Um, for national parks, for uh, forest service, where you know, you've got that American beautiful pass, we'll, we'll work it out with them. Um, it might be the case that you have to steward for a certain number of hours in exchange for that pass. Um, let's see. Did, I hope, and tell me in the chat if I failed to answer your question at all. Um, I hope I did. Uh, so Renee and Dennis Weeder are interested in sites in the West Desert that are military sites. Um, by the way, she wants them to also be close to casinos. <laughs> All right. Well, we got Wendover out there, so we'll see how close we can get you. Um, <laughs> uh, let's see. Robert Van Orden says, seem like special needs sites, um, tourism, volume tourism, uh, gun-toting yokels, etc., would be a high priority, high volume. Hey, Robert, can you take yourself off mute for a second to ask your question? I want to make sure that I understand. Um, what it is that you're asking. Mm. 
Okay. Well, Robert, if, if you're able in the, in, a, in the future, um, please do take yourself off mute um, because I'd, I'd like to know. I'd, oh, there you are. Great. Hi. Hi. The, uh, just seems like some areas are like pretty high impact, lots of tourism like Moab or, you know, like Steve and Diana are dealing with where they're dealing with gun toting locals and that kind of thing. Sometimes it seemed like they'd be a priority for you. Yeah. So, yeah, when we prioritize sites, we're talking with the agencies about which sites they would like to see um, stewarded. So, yeah, I mean, like not every site needs stewarding. Um, there's probably a couple of lithic scatters out on a mountainside somewhere that the worst impact that it's going to have is a deer pooping on it. Like they're probably fine. So you're right. It probably is. Um, if, if the threat to a site is human related, then sites that are in those high traffic areas, those high volume tourism areas, you're right. Those are absolutely um, going to be on our list. They're going to be a high priority. Um, and, you know, if that's, so that's what I'm saying. Like, if that's something you're comfortable with, if you're comfortable with crowds, that's great. If you want to know how to talk to people, um, we'll refer you to that Friends of Cedar Mesa program because we want to make sure that you can do that safely. Um, but if that's something that you have zero interest in, then we will find you a site that um, doesn't require you to, to interact with the public. Um, hey, Liz Robinson, I see that you have your hand raised. Um, how's it going? Good. Um, I have a question. I was a site stewardship member for Danger Cave, and I know there was monitoring there and stewardship there uh, for years by USAS. And um, unfortunately, because that program shifted from something being supported by SHPO to something I think with state parks, you know, I'm not sure where those records are. I'm just wondering with all of the data and the information that we're going to generate from stewardship, is that going directly to the land managing agencies? Is that something that your office is going to curate? And just watching out for like the long term, um, you know, data and that it is somewhere that's going to be useful. Exactly. Fantastic question. Um, the data management is honestly one of the biggest benefits that we see to the program. So the data comes directly to our office and um, our office ingests data from all manner of different places, right? From professional archaeologists, from, from agency archaeologists. We take in that data, we process it, we, we make sure that it's accurate and correct and that everything's copacetic. And then through, through our database, we push it out to everyone. So site records, site stewardship records, are going to become another records class in that database. And so if you have access to that database, we call it SEGO here in Utah, um, you'll have access to it. So uh, people will be able to use that for project planning, um, interested archaeologists who are like, who just want to learn more about how, um, how sites get damaged, that information will be there for them. Um, and that's why I like to consider um, site stewards as citizen scientists, because you guys will be producing really high quality data for us that's going to be uniform across different land management jurisdictions. And that information should be available fairly quickly. Um, sometimes it takes us a couple of weeks to turn around site forms. Um, if, if we had to switch our, this would never happen, if it took like 10 years for us to switch over from, let's say, PresPro to Sego, it might take us a little while to upload the data. That never happens, right, Liz? <laughs> we, um, we had a thing happen, but, <laughs> but we're, um, we're chewing through the backlog. And so with the site stewardship data, that would be just another records class for us. Thank you, Liz. Um, Tony says that he's hoping for a site around St. George because he lives in Nevada. I got good news. There's a couple things in St. George. So that's going to be great. Um, if we will, when we have the um, sign up form, which, you know, should be, we want to wait for our site stewardship coordinator to be hired before we start um, letting people tell us what they want. 
because we want to make sure our site stewardship coordinator is comfortable with this. I've been writing a lot of checks here today that that person's going to have to cash. So <laughs> we're going to take it a little slow for them. Um, and I'll let you know um, at the end of the presentation how you can stay um, informed and in touch about um, our next steps as we, as we bring our training online. Um, Chris asks, how do we find out what sites are available? That is a, that's the $10 million question, right? Um, so we're going to use the answers from your site stewardship questionnaire to call down the sites um, because we're, we're working on a couple of different levels. We are getting information from um, the, uh, the agency officials about like, here's the sites that are eligible. And then we're getting information from site stewards about here are the sites that I want and we're gonna try to match them. And so in most cases, we assume that there will be several good matches and you can look through those. Um, if you don't like those sites that are selected for you, then we will find a way to expand that search. And so how you find out what sites are available is by filling out our site stewardship um, volunteer application or, and filling out the questionnaire and then working personally with that site stewardship coordinator. And that's something that's going to become available um, in the winter. So that should be available probably before the training starts. And it also might be the case that some agencies come online faster than others because we need to start creating agreements like MOUs, Memorandum of, of Understanding with different agencies. And so that's gonna take different timelines for different agencies. So it might be the case that if we get you signed up in December or January, um, that we have one set of sites for you that's on say BLM land. But then by June, we might have a larger array of sites that includes like forest service land and state parks land. Um, and so if, if you would prefer to expand your, um, your portfolio of stewarded sites, you can absolutely do that. Um, Let's see, Nancy asks, when does the live training start? Excellent, the live training will start, COVID willing, knock on wood, in uh, February, late February, early March. So currently, Friends of Cedar Mesa and their Heritage Stewardship Program, they're running trainings, and it's going to be the same training that we have. So you can go ahead and take a training with them right now, and um, you'll get that checked off the box. And then when the Utah Site Stewardship Program through my office, the SHPO starts, you can just carry it on out. If you'd like to take a training through us, um, we will keep you updated and informed. Um, we'll be able to get that information to you and you know, look for it in, in February. Elizabeth, huh? um, in relation to that, we're using a app now um, with our site stewarding through Friends of Cedar Mesa. Will that app go away in lieu of the new one? Or are they gonna be pretty much the same? That is a great question. So um, that app will stay with Friends of Cedar Mesa. Um, that app will not go away, but that is one part that we, for bureaucratic reasons, are not able to transfer. Um, so we will have a different app, but it will function in the same way. The questions that it asks you, we don't envision that those will be different. Um, if a different, so if a different land managing agency needs different information, we, that's when we would be adding in like, you know, did you see a bird? I don't know what people need for data, you know, but that's, did you see a bird is not currently something that we ask through the heritage program. Through this cultural program, if someone needs to know that information, we will ask that additional information. Um, and we can give you, you know, a pardon, a quick training on how to use the app. Um, you know, we'll be able to go out with you guys, um, show you how to use the app. We could even work it over, the, over um, Zoom like this with you. We'll make sure that um, no one is confused about the app because it's, you know, it's really critical how you actually record these things. Um, we also do yeah, have, um, 
if you'd like a paper form. It should be pretty much the same paper form as you're already using. Yeah, I was trying to just confirm if we have something that's universal, like the program's going to be for all agencies. It'll be universal. So we're not using different apps for different places. No, um, no, you shouldn't be using different apps for different places. If you are, um, so the app that Heritage, the Heritage um, program has is called Arc Monitor. And so if you were using Arc Monitor, you're probably um, in a different state uh, because I know that they're working with different states to, because Arc Monitor is a fantastic program. Um, I've heard nothing but good things about it. So they're, they're trying to work it out with different states, but for lame bureaucratic reasons, we just weren't able to adopt that here. So. Um, Pat Sullivan, you have your hand raised. Um, do you want to ask your question? Okay, Pat, when you are able to um, just unmute yourself, just jump right in whenever you want. Stacy asks, I have memory problems and I'm a bit worried about the training with so much information all at once. Can I record the training so I can study more? Yeah, um, so here in the state of Utah, like the legal thing is you can record something as long as you tell someone you're recording it. Um, so you're free to record it. We also will have a training manual that will have a lot of the information, well, it'll have all of the information in there for you. We also envision having some videos that we will put online. So, you know, it might be just, you know, five minute snippets of information on different aspects of the training manual. So if video, if, you know, verbal communication is the way that you learn best, you'll have that at your disposal. You're always free to record us as shipowers at any time, ask for permission if there are other people in the room, um, and you'll have that physical hard copy manual if the way that you learn is through reading. So you should have a lot of different ways um, to have that information at your fingertips. And in the stewardship manual, we'll also have contacts for um, different agencies, um, contacts for us at the SHPO, you can always give us a call or send us an email at any time if you just have a question about something. So you should be ready to roll. Um, okay, Pat, it seems like you're having trouble unmuting. I have tried to unmute you using my grand wizardly powers, but I am unable to mute you. Ah, I, yep, I'm sorry. I. That was accidental. I didn't mean to ask a question. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. I think it was my elbow. Easiest question I've answered today. Okay. <laughs> uh, Tony asks, can we get the archeologist report of our site when we sign up for a site? Absolutely, yes. So those reports are usually kept under lock and key. Um, what you will have is you'll sign basically a waiver saying, I'm not going to tell everyone about this site. And then we'll be able to share that specific site record with you. So you'll see the official site record. Um, and what those look like are sometimes multiple boring pages of the same information repeated again and again, as archaeologists have gone to that site again and again. Sometimes it is a index card from 1962 that just says, this site had some pot sherds on it and I took them home. Um, those sites are really fun. So there's a lot of variability in the site records. And that's part of the reason why you'll have a professional archeologist go out with you the first time so that they can tell you like, this site record is garbage. We're here, we're gonna record the site or this site record has many years of history, this is what you need to be focusing on. Um, they'll help you cull some of that huge information. Um, let's see, Bob um, Eagland, I believe, says, um, how do we access the recording? Such a good question. The recording is live on Facebook right now. And so after this um, session is over, it'll take a little bit of processing time, 
but you will be able to access it on the Utah State History webpage. This is a part of the um, Utah State History 68th Annual Conference, and so it will be available there on the Utah State History page, as well as the SHPO page. Um, I work for both. I consider myself a SHPO employee because that's sort of my, you know, in the big bureaucratic pyramid, that's my nearest tier. Um, this will also be available on YouTube as well, starting tomorrow. It will take me a little bit of time to process it and um, upload it to YouTube. Um, since you found this probably via Eventbrite is my guess, um, I'm going to send out an email also using that Eventbrite email list. Um, and it's going to have some resources that we talked about today. Um, I can also put my slideshow up there in case you, you wanted any of that. Um, and I'll include links to our Facebook and our YouTube so that you can find this. So there should be enough ways for you to access the recording that you can choose the venue that you like the best. Um, just want to read Tony's comment because it's great. He loves the GPS coordinates or lack of in those records. He's talking about sometimes you get records that are before GPS and uh, some people are better at using maps than others. There's a lot of like, all right, to get there, you go down the road until you get thirsty and then you turn left at the dog. It's a lot of that sort of stuff. It's very cool. Um, someone else asks, when people sign up for the stewardship program, how will they find their sites? Will they be given coordinates and expected to have a GPS in order to find it? Such a good question. So, I mean, yeah, how do we get you out to the site for the first time? You will be um, escorted to your site by a professional archaeologist. So that professional archaeologist maybe has never seen the site before. And maybe all they have to go on is GPS coordinates. But it's going to be their responsibility to figure out how to get there. Um, a lot of times at our site forms, we also have access notes. So we'll know ahead of time, like, hey, this gate has a lock. You need to go the long way around, something like that. Um, so there will be someone knowledgeable and who has the authority to go with you um, to bring you there for the first time. Um, so you won't have to, I mean, this isn't like a geocaching expedition. Um, and let me really quickly do a couple of other things. Um, looks like we've got a few minutes left and I know that Wanda wanted to talk a little bit about a regional conference for site stewardship that she's planning. Um, Wanda, you want to give us a little bit of the lowdown on that? I'll be glad to. And, and first of all, I'm going to call you out as a speaker at our, our regional conference. So the regional conference was a, a brainstorm among site stewardship coordinators. And we originally had planned to do a small four corners area conference. It has since expanded to include most of the West and we've got some people who will be presenting from Florida. So it's, it's become quite a major event. Because of COVID, we can no longer have it in person. So it'll be split over two days and it will be available online. We hope to open up registration next week and you can learn about registration by contacting Elizabeth. And also, I will put my email address and the email address of a couple of the other people, Samantha Rubinson, the Nevada Site Stewardship Coordinator, and Beth Payden, who has formed the um, Partners in, in Archaeological Site Stewardship and was an original founder of the California Stewardship Program. We will all be available to help you where to find registration. You can also watch the Utah Heritage Stewardship Program Facebook page. We'll post the registration information there as well. The workshop is, will be divided into two days. The first day is learning about the site stewardship programs around the country and how they run, what apps are available, things like that. The second day is geared more towards stewards and we'll include a panel of stewards talking about their experiences in site stewardship. So I hope you tune in for both days. I think it'll be a really good everybody. Thanks.
Elizabeth. Thank you, Wanda. And thanks so much. This is the first of its kind conference, I think, um, the, the Site Stewardship Regional Conference. And I think it's a really great idea. Yeah, it is the first that we know of, and you know, we've reached out to many states, so I think we are the first. Hey, yeah, I mean, like, that's a really groundbreaking thing, and it's such a great idea. Like, get everyone together to talk about your site stewardship programs and, and what you like, what the challenges are, um, and how we can all do better. So in the chat, Wanda has put her email address. Um, we will also, in the email that I mentioned uh, that we would send out to you, we'll get you guys those links too. Um, you know, to, to all of these things, to the registration, to the heritage monitoring program, um, all, all the good stuff. Uh, we do have a couple of other questions before we close out today. Um, Troy Scotter asks, will we have some kind of identifier as a site steward? He says that he once had a pair of well-meaning BLM law enforcement officers who wanted to arrest him while he was recording a site. And that is such a polite way of say it, Troy, that I fear your Canadian is showing through. Um, so yeah, if you are a site steward, you probably do want some way to say like, hey, I'm legit, especially for sites that are a little off the beaten path. Professional archaeologists, for example, we always carry our work authorization in our pack so that if anyone finds us, we could say, I'm supposed to be here. Please, please don't arrest me. Um, so it is important to have some sort of identifier that you are a site steward. In our program, um, we have a couple of identifiers. First, you'll be given a certificate of completion, um, a nice glossy embossed certificate. That might not be something that you want to fold up and put in your backpack, but you're certainly able to. The other thing um, that you will have is your list of contacts. So if you explain to that law enforcement agents, law, law enforcement officer, sorry, who you are and why you're there, and they're still not, they're still giving you a hard time, um, say, hey, call this person at your own office. They'll tell you I'm okay. Or, you know, call this person at the state office. They'll be able to explain it to you. And I understand that you'll be going out perhaps after hours, perhaps in the evenings, on weekends. Um, so this is a, I will find out how we can get you some sort of identifier. Um, I know that we're having stickers made. That seems like, hey, look at this sticker on my water bottle. I get to be here. That's probably not going to fly. So we'll try to find some other way. Uh, maybe in addition to your eight and a half by 11 embossed I'm a site steward plaque, Maybe we can get you a, a small card that you can keep in your wallet that says site steward, here are the contacts, um, and has some sort of, you know, official state of Utah and official agency seals on it so that people don't give you a hard time. Um, we have another question that says, there's a mix of professional archaeologists and citizen scientists here joining us today. Um, can professional archaeologists participate as stewards on lands that they do not take care of through their own agencies. So a lot of our archaeologists that are on here today, you know, if you're a DOD archaeologist, can you go steward a site on like BLM land? Or if you work for a private contractor, can you go on to Forest Service land? And the answer is yes. And we're so excited to have professional archaeologists participate in this program. Um, not only can you like uh, steward a site that's outside of the jurisdiction where you work, you can be the person who helps other people find their sites for the first time, learn about their sites, um, learn how to like read the dirt, do all that stuff. Um, you can sort of mentor other people so that they know how to create the best data possible. Um, so if you do work for an agency um, who is participating in this program, you have your choice. You can choose to, to be a steward on some of your own sites. Um, or you can choose to never have to, you know, to, to uh, volunteer where you work. You can keep those totally separate. So you'll sign the same sort of volunteer agreement, the same sort of, um, I promise not to, you know, be a bad person stuff. 
um, and that will give you access to um, to whatever whatever site wherever in the state on any land management uh, jurisdiction that that you so choose. Um, Karen asks, is it possible to coordinate site stewards so that um, stewards can share a site if that steward is really only able to visit two or three times and maybe another person can pick up the slack? Yes, that is possible. That person would also have to be in the site stewardship program, um, but we'll work with you guys to figure out um, how, how we can share that schedule and how, how we can make sure that um, it gets monitored uh, at a regular interval. Okay, and then there's one more question and then I'm going to do a, a quick wrap. And if you have any other questions, please feel free to email me or call me. Um, Karen also asks, is there a way to contact the agency that manages the site to let them know that you will be on that site? She said that she's actually been detained while working and none of the authorization that she showed was sufficient. That is a horror story. We never want that to happen. So yes, um, in your site stewardship manual, you will have a list of all of the agency contacts and you should be given that information when you're assigned your site. So, you know, if you're going out into uh, the backwoods of Vernal, say, you should be able to say like, hey, archeologist here in Vernal, let your law enforcement know that I'll be out here. Um, we can also give you the law enforcement contacts as well so that you can give them a heads up. And I know I said that that was the last question, but David Christensen has a question. Uh, David, can you, uh, thanks, hey. <laughs> hey, how's it going? Say, um, mm -hmm. it's kind of interesting that there's people being detained because the whole reason why we have you know, want site stewards is because we don't have enough people out there to, <laughs> to monitor these. So it's kind of interesting that these people have run into the, the few law enforcement that we have, at, at least in the BLM. Um, I just wanted to reiterate, you know, everything you've said today and everyone that, what everyone's uh, commented on and say, you know, we're excited for this. Uh, at least I am. Um, it's part of the, the BLM here in Vernal, Utah and being able to um, have people out there, you know, in the field helping us out because, yeah, we can't, uh, we can't monitor every site. We can't take care of everything. And um, it's just awesome to, to see people that are interested and, and hopefully this will continue to grow and, and we'll be able to continue to protect sites that are important to, <clears throat> to all of us here. Um, but yeah, we, you know, as, as far as BLM, as, as I'm concerned, you know, we, you know, if, if, even if you can only come and, and visit a site once a year or whatever, I'm, I'd be happy to hear, hear from anybody about any kind of sites that they're interested in. And, and, and there's tons of sites out there, any, any kind of site that you want to monitor or that you want to be a part of, you know, probably near where you live or other places you visit, there's always going to be different kinds of sites and we can definitely find those sites for you guys. So just want to say thanks and uh, yeah, let us know if, however we can help and we're going to keep working with uh, Shippo and everyone else to make this the best we can. So thanks. Thank you. For those of you who don't know Dave, he's a good egg. He works at the BLM. Um, and uh, yeah, we're, we're, <laughs> that's very surprising, like I said, and, and troubling to hear that people have been um, detained or had uh, un unprofitable, unpleasant counters with law enforcement. We don't want that to happen. All right, so the very last thing before uh, we leave today, before we break, is what's next? We've talked a little bit about what's going to happen, um, but I wanna make sure that you guys have a clear picture of our roadmap. So the first thing that we can do, um, what you can do right here today, sorry, I'm trying to bring up the chat window and I'm having a hard time, is you can go to this URL, bit.ly slash site stewardship interest. I'm also putting it in the chat. It will be available um, in that email that I send out, uh, probably tomorrow it'll go out. So you'll have that in that email as well. It's just a contact form. It's so that we can keep you updated on site stewardship as it progresses. Um, Right now, we are in the process of hiring that coordinator and building the program. 
So the moment that coordinator is hired, we will introduce you to them. And the moment that we get our web page up, you will be able to fill out your stewardship application. And that application is what's going to start the process of you getting into a training and getting signed up for a site to get you out in the field and stewarding. So the site stewardship coordinator, um, when they're hired and when we do get these things rolling, they're the ones who will get you uh, into a site, uh, into, sorry, a training session. Um, like I said, we anticipate those training sessions will start in the late winter or early spring and COVID allowing, we really hope to be able to see you in person. Um, pardon. The last thing that you can do right now um, is you can start reading up about Utah archeological sites um, and think about what it is you wanna do with stewardship. If, if what you wanna do is take a hike once a quarter um, and leave it at that, Super great. We're so happy, so happy to have you help us. Um, if what you want to do is do some in-depth research on a site, um, like Stacy said, go to a site at different hours of the day and photograph it in different ways and think about how people might have interacted with the topography. That's so cool too. And that's real archaeology. So think about what your personal education and knowledge goals will be so that we can start talking to you about that. Um, when the site stewardship coordinator comes on, you can let them know what you wanna get out of stewardship. And you can always talk to me at any time. Um, my email, I'll put up here again, email's the easiest way to contact me. Actually, let's just go to that page now. So <laughs> here's who I am again. Um, I'm Elizabeth, I'm the one in this photograph. I am showing my butt really prominently to you because like I said at the beginning, there is not a single professional photograph of me in existence. Um, so you feel free to contact me with any questions. Um, that's my email, the best way to contact me. You can also call me. And like I said, those calls are routing to my personal cell phone. So it's quite likely that you'll be able to get a hold of me. Um, and we can always, I'm happy to just talk it out with you. Like, what is site stewardship? What are your personal goals? happy to work with you guys on a one-by-one -one basis because what you're about to do and what some of you are already doing is important. And we take your time and your participation very seriously. And we want you to know that you're loved and cared for just as you love and care for our archeological sites. So with that, thank you all so much. Um, I really appreciate that you all took some time to show up with your ideas and your awesome questions, some of which that stumped me a little bit. <laughs> um, this, is, this was better than I even could have hoped. So thank you all so much. Um, and let me know if you've got any questions. I'll talk to you later. Bye. <laughs>